This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nanofabrication. I'm Chris Mack, and this is Lecture 16, Part 1 of our series on ion implantation. The reading for these lectures is 5 of our textbook by Campbell. Ion implantation uh, took over from diffusion as a method of introducing dopants onto the silicon wafer. And in the series of lectures on diffusion, you recall that we talked about putting our wafers in a diffusion furnace, introducing a gas at a very high temperature and allowing that gas to um, accumulate on the surface of the wafer and then diffuse into the wafer. Um, by the late 70s, by 1980, uh, ion implantation had replaced diffusion as a method of introducing dopants into the wafer for the vast majority of, of state-of-the-art processes, and it's been that way ever since. The reasons are the ability of implant to achieve fine dose control, to create shallow junctions and very well controlled junctions, and to tailor the profiles of the dopants in ways that are not possible to do with standard diffusion methods of introducing dopants. The major settings, the major choices we have when designing an ion implantation process are the ion species that we use, the ion energy that we choose, and the implant dose. Uh, we also have uh, a few other important parameters uh, like the temperature of the wafer and uh, the angle of the implant which impact um, the process as well. But these are the main things. What type of ion are we going to use? <coughs> Excuse me. The energy and the dose. So, when we use ion implantation in CMOS devices, it turns out that there's lots and lots of different ways that we use implantation, that we use dopants. In fact, ion implantation is performed dozens of times in a modern CMOS device, especially a logic device. We do it for making the N wells and the P wells. Remember, these are the regions where we're actually going to build our transistors. Um, in between those regions, we have uh, isolation regions, but we will often create diodes to prevent current flow as well. Uh, diodes, a, PN, a reverse bias PN junction, will prevent current from flowing. So if we stick PN junctions in the right place and uh, the right properties so that they remain reverse biased the entire time that our device is operating, we will be able to create avenues that block any potential current flow, for example, current flow to the substrate. So we'll frequently add uh, dopants in regions to create these junctions and prevent uh, stray current. Uh, contacts. If we take a metal and we make contact with the silicon wafer, uh, metal and silicon often results in the formation of a diode rather than a contact. Well, if what you want is a contact and what you get is a diode, that's not a good thing we'll often dope the wafer to prevent diode formation and to lower the contact resistance. Uh, when we use a polysilicon material as our gate, we generally want that polysilicon to be a good conductor. So we'll add dopants to the polysilicon to make it more like a metal, more like a conductor. That's uh, polysilicon is often used in the M of MOS, the metal oxide semiconductor. The metal is often uh, polysilicon that's been doped heavily. And we'll use ion implantation to do that. Uh, we'll use ion implantation for threshold voltage adjustment underneath the gate and for the source and drain formation. And these for source and drain formation steps are now quite complicated. Uh, lightly doped drains, halos, uh, various ways of creating exactly the right profile of dopant as a function of X, Y, and Z. So let's look at the tools that are used uh, in performing ion implantation. In the lex next lecture, we'll look at the physics of how implantation works in the wafer. So what happens to an ion when it hits the wafer. But right now, let's look at how we actually get those ions shooting off at the wafer. Well, first, we need to generate an ion of the desired dopant species. 
could be arsenic or boron, etc. They're ionized. The reason we ionize them is so that we can accelerate them using a voltage. So that's the next step. We accelerate these ions, we form them into a beam of the proper shape and at a specified energy. Then we scan the wafer under the beam and stop when the dose, the, the number of dopants per unit area, reaches the set point, the, the point that we're trying to achieve. It's important to note that this is a relatively low temperature process. Sometimes the wafers can heat up while they're being implanted, but basically this is a low temperature process, which means that when the ions disrupt the crystal structure of the silicon wafer, we create an amorphous silicon in the region where the implant dose is, is high enough. Uh, that amorphous material will stay amorphous throughout this ion implantation process, and we have to separately and in a separate process, anneal. Put it in a furnace, bring it up to a very high temperature, and regrow the crystal in the regions where the crystal has been damaged by ion implantation. Let's look at the ion implanters and their basic components. First, the source of ions. We can use a gas or we can sputter uh, off of a solid uh, to create a vapor of the material that we're interested in. There's lots of different choices arsine, arsenic pentafluoride to deliver uh, arsenic, phosphine is very uh, commonly used, diborane or borane trifluoride, uh, both materials that are sometimes used uh, to deliver boron. Note that many of these gases are extremely toxic. Uh, obviously arsenic is not something you want to uh, ingest in any kind of quantity. Phosphine, very dangerous, it's one of those um, gases which uh, if, if brought into contact will air, with air will spontaneously combust. Right, so there's a lot of safety features that go into the piping of these gases into our ion implanter. Then we apply some voltage, some current, uh, usually some stream of electrons uh, from a hot filament that uh, creates a plasma. The electrons smash into the gas molecules, they become ionized, and an ionized gas is, is called a plasma. Then we accelerate these ions um, by applying a voltage. So uh, we take um, these ions, which are hanging out in the gas, and we apply a voltage from uh, uh, one side to the other. Uh, on the, uh, over here, we'll, we'll have something that looks like a wire grid. You know, so it's wire. We can apply a voltage to it, but it's got lots of holes in it. So it's a negative voltage, the positive ions are attracted, they're accelerated towards this voltage. Um, but most of the ions will pass through the holes rather than smashing into the wire. And uh, as a result, we'll have ions traveling uh, through this mesh at the specified energy. What energy is it? Well, the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. You probably recall that from our introductory physics classes. But also, uh, the, the energy that we, we supply with this voltage is Q times V. Q is the uh, um, charge on, on the molecule and, or atom, and V is the voltage that we've applied. Um, by the way, you, you may have noticed that some of our units for energy are electron volts. And if you're not familiar with an electron volt, it's very, very simple. It's the energy you'd apply that you would give to an electron if you accelerated that electron over a voltage of one volt. All right. So if Q, if these are singly charged atoms or molecules, Q is simply the charge on electron, V is the voltage, so Q times V, if you expressed it in electron volts, would be the voltage with the unit turned to electron volts. So if you have a, a thousand volts, the resulting energy of the singly charged atom or molecule would be one, uh, if it was a thousand volts, it would be a thousand electron volts. And that then, we, we specify what voltage we want, that determines what energy we get coming out of our ion accelerator. Now, these accelerated ions are then put into a mass spectrometer, mass spec, also called a mass analyzer. And this mass spec is a set of perpendicular magnetic fields. So the magnet, be some permanent magnet here, 
resulting in magnetic fields. In this case, I show them going into the screen or into the page. Uh, so here's my ion source. We accelerate them through some voltage, and the result is uh, ions traveling with a velocity in this direction. It comes into this electric field, and uh, excuse me, magnetic field. So it comes into this magnetic field. The magnetic field is perpendicular to the direction of the accelerated uh, ions, and that results in a force. Whenever a, a moving charge is put into a magnetic field, the force on those particles is Q times V cross B. Uh, these are velocity of the, the ion, B is the magnetic field, the cross product results in a force perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the moving electron direction. Uh, that results, that causes a curving of the path of the ions. So the force, it, when I first enter, the force is perpendicular to the direction of the ions and the direction of uh, the magnetic field going into the page. The result is a force pushing in this direction. And it starts to curve or bend the path of the ions. Uh, the force is also equal to the mass times the acceleration. The acceleration is what is, is the change in velocity is caused by the curvature or is the curvature of the path and so this force is also mass times the velocity squared divided by the radius of curvature. Now we know what the velocity is because we have set the kinetic energy with the accelerating voltage that we've applied. So we plug in what we know for the velocity into this equation for the force and what we find is the quantity m over q times r squared is a constant. The constant has the voltage and the magnet magnitude of the magnetic field in it. Um, what does that mean though? What it means is for every value of m over q, those ions will trace out a particular radius of curvature, r. Because this whole quantity is a constant, Therefore, for any particular mass divided by charge, we will get a particular radius of curvature. So, if I have heavier ions, m over q is bigger, and so r squared will be bigger as well, and we'll get a larger radius of curvature, and uh, these things won't curve as much as they come out of our mass analyzer. On the other hand, if I had lighter ions, m over q is smaller, so I would get a smaller r squared, a uh, greater amount of curvature because the, the smaller uh, radius compared to the bigger radius uh, for the heavier ions. And if I put an aperture here at just the right place, I can collect only those ions with a spe specific m over q. We can make that a fairly narrow range of mass over charge. So if I have, say, a doubly ionized um, boron atom, uh, it's not going to make it through because m over q will be, will be too small. If I have um, a boron difluoride ion, for example, well, that mass is going to be too big and it will get blocked. Uh, so only the right ion with the right charge will make it through the mass analyzer. The result is a beam of a single ion with just the right charge and just the right mass. All the other ion species that might be present when I created my plasma, and there's a lot of them, a lot of different ion species uh, out of that plasma. Only the one I want will end up heading towards the wafer. Then I'll put that beam into another ion accelerator to set it to the desired energy. I'll put a bend in that path just to make sure that any neutrals that might uh, be there will, will not get bent. So I bend things by just adding an electric field. Um, uh, sometimes the ions as they're traveling will bump into each other and, and neutralize each other. 
uh, I'll put a bend to get rid of any neutrals um, before they hit the wafer. Then I will uh, use that beam to expose the wafer with ions. To do that, we need a beam sweeper. There's several different ways we could do that. First, we can use parallel plates. Two parallel plates with an electric field across them, a voltage across them, will cause the beam to bend. And by varying the voltage, I can vary the, the bending of the electrons. Um, if I put two of these, you know, one in left and right, and one top and bottom, I can write this thing in a raster scan. This is how old uh, television sets used to work, CRT screens. Uh, we had a beam of electrons striking a phosphor in the television, making a glow, and then I had just a pair of pal parallel plates right to left, pair of parallel plates top and bottom, and uh, I do a raster scan to scan the whole screen with that beam of electrons. That's exactly what we can do here. Or I could just have one pair of wafers, say uh, left and right, one pair of, of plates rather, left and right, with a voltage across them that I change so I scan the electron beam back and forth, left and right. Then I move the wafer up and down and I can get the whole wafer covered. Or alternately, I can have the beam in stationary position, either a single beam or maybe I can somehow figure out how to create a ribbon, a narrow long beam, and then I scan the wafer in two dimensions past this beam so that the whole wafer gets covered. Um, I'll often have multiple wafers in one chamber, and then uh, I'll often rotate that, that uh, multiple wafer chamber uh, or rotate the wafers themselves in order to maximize the uniformity of the coverage of the beam over the wafers. And finally, I need a method of dose control. The dose, remember, is the number of dopant ions per unit area, or the number of dopant atoms per unit area. And uh, we typically measure this by, by recognizing that our dopants are ionized. They are charged. And therefore, supplying them to our wafer is supplying a current. If I ground the wafer and measure how, much, how many electrons are required to go into the wafer to neutralize all of those charged ions that I'm putting in, I can measure the dose. And we do that with a device called a Faraday cup. Typically, the doses that we use are on the order of 10 to the 12th to 10 to the 16th uh, dopants per centimeter squared. Sometimes we might go a little lower, down to 10 to the 11th and for special cases, and higher than 10 to the 16th for other special cases. But this is a pretty typical range of doses in CMOS processing. And finally, the wafers are typic typically cooled. So we have some cooling going on at the backside of the wafer. Um, the reason is smashing high energy ions into the wafer heats up the wafer. All that energy is being dissipated in the wafer. Uh, typically at the very top of, of the wafer. Uh, sometimes it's photoresist that we're using as a mass to block ions where we don't want them. Sometimes it's oxide. And uh, these materials will get hot and could possibly uh, uh, chemically changed, get chem chemically changed because of the heat, so we cool the wafers to prevent that from happening. These tools are reasonably expensive, maybe $5 million. Uh, you typically have to buy quite a few of them for a fan because there are dozens of vine implantation steps. Uh, the tools are typically optimized for the low energy regime or the medium energy regime or the high energy regime. And energies can go as low as 1 kV and as high as 3 MeV, although more like uh, 100 to 1,000 EV is the tip more typical range for um, most of the process steps that we need. Well, that's my uh, introductory discussion of ion implantation. What have we learned? You should be able to answer these questions quickly. Uh, what are the three major process parameters for ion implantation? How many CMOS process steps can you name that use ion implantation? We went through a few. Do you remember them? Describe how a mass spectrometer, or also called a mass analyzer, works. And finally, how is dose controlled? Define dose, and then tell me how dose is controlled in ion implantation. 
Well, next time we'll look a little bit more closely at the implant process, see what happens to these ions when they smash into a silicon wafer. Till then.